be a light for you in dark places when all other lights go out. Hello guys, this is DCHL Devin here and welcome to another how to play, how to buy video. And today I'm going to be talking about an army that I went and played at Throne of Skulls in December 2018, which is of course just last weekend if you're watching this relatively soon. Uh, I actually was going to play this army one more time before I went ahead and made this video. I was supposed to go to a tournament in Nashville, Tennessee. Unfortunately, a lot of my group had to cancel, and so I couldn't make it to that. However, I think from Throne of Skulls and just simply experimenting with the basics of it, I kind of feel like I know how this army is supposed to work. That plus, Betador doesn't have any allies, which we'll get into, and also it doesn't have a huge plethora of options as far as troop choices and hero options that aren't seen in other factions that I've played. So essentially it doesn't need a whole lot of playtesting before I kind of understand the mechanics of it. I'll let you guys know what I did playtest and what I did not so that way maybe you guys can kind of go off of some of my theories of how it might play with a few other different true choices instead of the main ones. So let's go ahead and get into it. For you guys who don't know, we start with the pros, the cons, the how to play as far as tactical, and then how to buy section of the video. So let's start off with the pros. And of course, we gotta mention the big man himself. You have the strongest evil hero in the game. Now this is kind of debatable. I guess you could say Sauron, I mean, sorry, the Palrog and Smaug might be stronger than Sauron, but Let's just agree to say that he is one of the strongest, most terrifying models in the game. He has an arsenal of spells, he's very strong physically, and he has a lot of options as far as like kind of a mobility in a sense. So let's go ahead and into it as far as like his spells are concerned. First off, he has an 18 inch casting range on all of his spells. That means he can outcast any other caster and also he can harass uh, enemy models as far as like them using their will to resist his spells one turn sooner than most casters can. So this helps a lot where if you're in far deployments like 12 inches up from your own board edge and the opponent's 12 inches up so you have 24 inches theoretically between you, you actually have a lot more time to keep punishing them spells where by the time they reach you, you can do an easy transfix and then wipe them out. Also, your spells are incredibly easy to cast. Oftentimes, you only really need one or two dice to cast anything and ensure yourself a pretty good chance that they're gonna need to resist it. This is actually an excellent bonus with Sauron. He doesn't need to waste a lot of his will casting and instead can use a lot of it to resist spells instead. On top of that, he has resistance to magic, so you can cast a free one and then resist with a free one and not even worry about your own store. This is a fantastic bonus with him. He's easily one of the best spellcasters in the game. That combined with the fact that he has a wide arsenal of spells for you to use, the only one really beating him is the Necromancer, which is kind of ironic considering it's actually the same character but in a stronger form. But overall though, it's understandable. Uh, what he does have, his options, are incredibly good. And he actually casts better than the Necromancer anyway. Most of, um, in fact, every single spell he has goes off on a four up or a lower, which actually makes Sapwell useful. Uh, a lot of people feel that Sapwell on a five plus may not be economically feasible unless you like need to cast it on something that uses just its will to hold its abilities in place, like Kyrdin or the Shade. Um, but for him, it's a four up and also is instill fear as a four up, which uh, once again, most people it's five up. So he has a more economical casting value beyond that. His transfix is on a two up and compel on a three up. I mean, these are incredibly easy spells to cast. You'll find most of your opponents probably be in disbelief as you cast a spell in such low rolls. So the next thing about Sauron we gotta get into is he doesn't need to heroic strike to assassinate. Now in this new game of SBG, transfix and compel, or mainly transfix, uh, since compel just uses transfix, uh, they don't have the stats of the hero that you're targeting unless you channel the spell. Well, in this case, Sauron doesn't actually need to uh, deal, uh, like that doesn't really cause any problems to him. Most people need to heroic strike in order to finish off the assassination. Otherwise, you just transfix to kind of hold the hero in place or maybe get into a combat with him just under the pretense that he won't be able to strike you, but you often won't win it. Well, with Sauron being a fight of nine, you can actually compel a model out of ranks and then just attack with Sauron at base stats and kill the model outright, regardless of if he's even a strong hero like Aragorn. So this is actually something that you should definitely take advantage of. Sauron should be hero hunting around quite a bit due to this. And that also saves his might for better things like hero combats. 
Next we have he's hard to kill. So he's the leader of your army and he's defense 10, which is fantastic for you because you really don't want this guy wounded, especially due to your army bonus, which we'll explain later. Now, unfortunately, he doesn't have any fates, which means that as soon as he's wounded once, he will provide the general wounding point. But actually killing Sauron is really, really difficult. So just note that that you have a general and a provider of an army bonus that's actually hard to get rid of. Uh, he often kills on fours on heroes. Generally, you won't spend Sauron like killing off basic troops and such. I mean, maybe to get somewhere, but overall he won't be doing that. Oftentimes, he'll go around hero hunting and taking out the opponent's leadership that would destroy your army. Now, with that, oftentimes they are defense seven. So at defense seven, you wound most of them on fours. This is a great value. Even if they're defense eight, once again, uh, you still wound them on fours. So hardly you're going to get a hero at defense nine or more. So Sauron is able to kill quite often. Now, if you want to, you can even give Sauron an axe. Now, this is highly not canonical, of course. He has a mace in the movies and a mace in his hand. However, if you do give him an axe and you make him piercing strike in a combat that you know he's safe, such as you compelled the hero to charge you, uh, or not charge you, but compelled him out of ranks and you charged him, then now you only need threes. You can piercing strike pretty easily and not have to worry about your defense being dropped since the opponent can't strike anyway. Therefore, you will wound defense 7 on 3s, and uh, honestly, at that point, everything's going to die. So, at uh, next, he leads 24 models. This is actually a crucial bonus because he is so expensive, he's going to cut into your numbers quite heavily, which we'll get into later. Then he also has now Brutal Power Attacks. Now this is kind of a subtle change to Sauron that a lot of people might not actually notice, but with the Brutal Power Attacks, you're gonna find one of his two most important ones are of course Barge and Hurl. With, uh, well, Rend if you're feeling, uh, it's facing against an Iron Hills Chariot, but uh, with Barge, it allows Sauron to not get stuck into combats he doesn't wanna be in. Let's say your opponent gets priority, you can allow your opponent to go first and that's perfectly fine. Just barge the models out of the way and then move again to the combat situation you want to be in without spending those precious three mites that he need for her a combat so next bonus for Betador the pros is the army bonus itself the army bonus is insanely powerful guys do not underestimate this army bonus and it's actually because of this army bonus that it doesn't make any sense to play this faction without Sauron that and the fact that if you do play the faction without Sauron, then uh, pretty much you might as well have just played Mordor because Mordor has every option that Betador has with the exception of Sauron. So if you don't play Sauron, then just play Mordor and get the bonus for Mordor. So with that in mind, Sauron is required, but when you do pick him, you can't break as long as Sauron has three or more wounds remaining. This is huge. With that, the game ends when you feel like it should end. It ends when your opponent breaks. Also, this is a heavy VP denier. Your opponent will not only be have to kill the same model to get general breaking points, but also just to break you in general, like at all. And that is a massive advantage. There are a lot of matchups where you should generally lose the game. Let's say Lords of Battle, for instance. Uh, in Lords of Battle, you uh, oftentimes you're going to play a horde, which means your opponent will outkill what you are killing of theirs, especially since your orcs are very easy to kill, but also don't kill very often. However, because you can't break and because you're denying general VPs, you can, if, as long as you can kind of keep in tandem with your opponent and only give them three points for the Lords of Battle, they will be denied the breaking in the general. If you can achieve that, you will get five points and they will have three, which means you will win the game despite their kill count is much higher than yours. So this is something definitely to keep in mind is that you now have an evened out playing field in match types where you normally wouldn't have it. This also comes into play in a lot of other scenarios where you know, just breaking your army becomes that much harder because you must wound Sauron three times. And uh, that is a bonus I would not give up. Do not ally this army. You do not want anything uh, to take away this bonus. Also, the fact that your orcs don't run away for, due to breaking is fantastic. Yes, you should bring a shaman, but a shaman generally won't cover a 60-man horde or whatever your points allows. So uh, having the ability to not have to worry about breaking at all is absolutely something worth considering. And uh, the orcs can be sacrificed as buffer zones, which is another thing. Uh, Sauron is going to want to hunt heroes down. Well, what you don't want is, although, let's say, Sauron can deal with Thranduil individually and Dane individually and Gandalf individually, all three of them at once, 
probably will be able to take him out. So you want the orcs to be able to be sacrificed. And of course, yeah, these heroes will rip and tear through your orcs, but you don't care because you won't break. Meanwhile, Sauron is dealing with them one at a time and destroying them. So this is something that is a fantastic bonus for this army. Next, you have a Horde Army or Elite Army. You can kind of customize and build out this army. And I'll let you know at Throne of Skulls, I actually played it out with the Orc variant of this. In other words, I picked Sauron with a huge horde of Orcs just kind of spammed out everywhere. However, this army does have access to Black Numenorians. Unfortunately, not Moran and Orcs, but Black Numenorians instead. The Black Numenorians have a few disadvantages. They can't benefit from Fury, but they do get a Warhorn. And they can't benefit from Orc Drummers, but they can benefit from the Troll Drummer. Now, I didn't experiment with this, but I do invite you to do so. It does seem like a worthwhile option. Uh, you can just put Spear Orcs in the back, and that should cover your two attack ranks. So after that, you have strong casting in general. Now, we talked about Sauron's, of course, but you also have access to the Nine Wraiths and, of course, most importantly, the Witch King. The Witch King adds another strong caster and strong attacker. Giving him the Morgul Crown not only makes him a viable person to run around and create a second threat, but also gives you double casting, which then weakens heroes that much faster for Sauron to eventually kill. Then you have solid mobility. Solid mobility options, it means basically you have models that move quickly, but for a good price. So Warg Riders are 11 points, which is a absolutely fantastic option for a 10 inch moving model that has strength four. And uh, when you're charging, knocking things down, that can be crucial. Guys, you must pick Calvary. I can't stress that enough. It helped me in so many games. I mean, yeah, sure, could you win without them? Absolutely, but just by simply having five Warg Riders really can help your game, especially when siege weapons come into play, which Sauron's not going to like very much. So you need something to take those things out. You need something to kind of reach into the back ranks, threaten wizards that are constantly casting at you, stuff like that. I think Warg Riders are a fantastic option. And then if you really want to get them stronger, just upgrade to Morgul Knights. They're a lot more expensive option, but they are just more hard-hitting and, of course, hard to take down at range. So you also, beyond the uh, mobility of your cavalry options, you also have Troll Drummers, which can increase the movement speed of everything you have, including Sauron, which means he gets a three inch further casting range. Very important for that. And then you have Fell Beasts. Now, of course, Troll Drummers can affect Fell Beasts. However, you'd be hard pressed to get Sauron, a Fell Beast, and a Troll Drummer in your list. But Fell Beasts themselves, of course, are 12 inch moving models due to their flying special role. And they can add another element of mobility that you need for your army. So I say that this army is a nice block rank type of army, but with solid mobility options. And that is excellent flexibility for your army. Now let's go ahead and get into the cons of this army because like any army, they do have some. One, they have no allies. They are on their own, a possible ally with every single army in the game. I believe maybe barring Smaug if I'm wrong, but I mean, honestly, that wouldn't be worth allying into. So you have no allies and I would not recommend allying. Your bonus is entirely too precious to ever ally any other army. So just don't bother with it, accept it as what it is and you just simply are gonna be fighting on your own. You have weak archery. The only archery you have that's any viable are trackers, which I would sprinkle in maybe six, just to kind of create some cheeky shots. But to be honest, you're probably gonna be throwing your trackers more often into combat to once again, create those buffer zones. Your army will die quickly. And then also, uh, the only other one you have is Siege Weapons, in the sense of uh, mostly the Catapult. The Mortal Catapult uh, can provide an option to bring the opponent to you. However, though, if your opponent has Siege Weapons, and you're going to end up going to them anyway, because Sauron cannot tank those shots for very long, he's going to need those things destroyed. Hence, having some cab of your own, maybe. Uh, uh, beyond that, you have Siege Bows, which barely hit. Guys, I brought one. Uh, you probably need two or three in order to make those things worthwhile. Yeah, once in a game I might get a lucky shot that can disrupt things, but overall it, it maybe hits about once a game. And uh, otherwise you have regular Orc Archers. I wouldn't even bother with them. They just simply do not do what you need them to do. Uh, the next con is Sauron. He takes so many points. Uh, guys, unless you're playing a thousand point game, you are going to be really tiny on numbers. It's going to kind of hurt. Uh, I would say I wouldn't play this army any less than about 700 points. You're Any less than that, and you're really just risking your army being simply Sauron and just a couple of dudes. It's 
probably not worth it. I would say at 600, you can get 24 Orc, Sauron, and then maybe something else, a Captain possibly. Uh, but that's about it. You, you just aren't going to have that many options. Now, at 600 points, your army, your opponents won't have that much either. But just note that you're going to have trouble because Sauron will be your only threat. And that's where the issue comes in, is that you really want Sauron plus another threat, if possible. But if you're really good at the game, you could probably pull it off with just Sauron, but most good opponents will maybe be able to deal with him if he's by himself as your only threat. And uh, Sauron can also feel very fragile because of the army bonus. Now this is kind of weird because you would say, well, Sauron has five wounds, defense 10, and he has a two up fate save with his ring. Uh, but the problem with the ring is by the time you start using the ring, you have already lost your army bonus. So if you're trying to protect your army bonus, you're going to be in a position where Sauron really just can't be thrown out there. You don't want him getting hit by too many siege weapon shots. One siege weapon shot, you keep your bonus. Second one, you lose it. So you really don't want him getting hit by that too many times. And the second thing about it is like, if you throw him up against just Aragorns and Nazogs and people who actually wound Sauron easily and they're already fresh, then you're going to have an issue where they can probably resist your spell, heroic strike, win the roll off, and then wound Sauron enough times to break your bonus. So you're going to end up putting Sauron in situations where you use your orcs to kind of create those buffer zones in order to prevent him from actually getting hurt. If you have someone who has banishment, like, you know, let's say uh, Gandalf the White, Tom Bombadil, Galadriel, combined with Fortify Spirit, or even Tom Bombadil who can't even be targeted, you're then going to have new problems as those models constantly harass you and your precious will points in order to stop you from just being auto-wounded. So luckily you have resistance to magic to deal with that, but that is something that you will feel Sauron is slightly more fragile than you originally used to. So let's get into the how to play part of this video. Um, first off, take Sauron. Uh, so if we're talking about list building, you gotta take Sauron. If you don't take Sauron, just play Mordor. It doesn't make any sense to play this army if you don't play Sauron. So start off, take Sauron. Then I would, me personally, spam out on orcs to create your buffer zones. Your buffer zones are essentially, if you have Sauron, he's gonna wanna hunt one hero at a time. So your orcs are really there as distractions for the rest of the army. If your opponent's army manages to bog Sauron down, down, then all it takes is one bad roll on your part and then eventually they'll wound him enough times. So you want your orcs to kind of like really mob out and just create like, you know, essentially flanks for you. And uh, give all your orcs picks if you can. Um, the thing is, orcs picks uh, allow them to go to that precious strength four. Now remember, because you're not really going to break you don't have to worry about the defense drop too much i mean use it wisely when you got them surrounded stuff like that if you're in a one-on-one -on -one combat or a two-on-two -two combat with like a two, with elves i probably wouldn't use it then you want to kind of make sure you're on more of the winning edge but ultimately you do bring picks so that way you can piercing strike when you need to fighting defense six armies are very annoying if you're fighting against dwarves and stuff then you're pretty much just at the mercy of just hoping you get a six sauron can also of course deal with iron hills and stuff like that but yes, giving picks to orcs, I absolutely recommend. Uh, then you want one other threat if possible. Now, I would recommend one of two, either the Witch King. You don't need him necessarily on a Fell Beast because his Mortal Crown gives him three attacks, so four on the charge. And if you have a banner that's five dice, I, he's pretty much able to kill what he needs to. Uh, the other option is a Troll Drummer, which, as I said, not only increases the range of your entire army's movement, but also increases the range of Sauron's spells. Now, regardless of which one you take, I think both of them are solid options, but I will let you know that I have not tested enough with either of them to recommend one to you. However, if I were to go to Articon today and take one, it might be probably the Witch King. Uh, nah, probably the Troll Drummer, actually, just for the cheaper cost. So most likely uh, 700 points, 800 points, I'll take Troll Drummer, and uh, that way I can get my army across the board without an issue. Um, so. Then next, I'd say take a banner for Sauron, just for Sauron. So have a banner, obviously, for the VPs and to the death and heirlooms of ages past, but also it's so that way Sauron doesn't lose a fight. You'd be surprised how often four dice will lose a fight. It's actually fairly annoying. So give him that fifth dice. It's always beautiful. Uh, remember, you can't spear support him anymore because your base size is too small with the orcs. Next, take cavalry. Just five is fine. Yeah, I honestly would did fine with just five warg riders. I really think that a few cavalry models are going to be needed if you want to disable siege weapons or cause harassment or even just objectives in general. I found them even useful in Fog of War. So lastly, I would say take a Shaman. 
The reason why is because unlike a Balrog, Sauron for some reason does not make your army fearless. And uh, I mean, yeah, sure, you're not going to break very much, almost ever. I think in all of my games, I only broke once. And so uh, you, you're probably not going to break very much, but you do want to attack terrifying models. That is so annoying when you have an enemy troll and you can't surround it in order to give Sauron double strikes and all that stuff. Now, there are ways to trap models without actually charging them. I understand that. But you do want to be able to also tie up things and, and just having a fury bubble is actually worth it. Uh, the other thing about the Shaman is it allows a second target for people. A lot of times people will start to feel tempted to target the Shaman rather than Sauron with their magic and that's great. It distracts targets from them. So use the orcs, of course, to protect, uh, protect Sauron. I already mentioned, of course, don't sacrifice them too fast because you don't want them to die. So what you don't want to do is don't shove your orcs in front of Sauron and just let them take all this damage. You are not invulnerable. If your army dies, then uh, they're going to be able to take out Sauron pretty easily. So you do actually want Sauron to be in there doing work while your orcs are kind of suffering, I guess you can say. Also, take note into the death. Uh, that match does award victory points for um, being quartered. So yeah, sure, you won't get them the breaking points, but they can quarter you and get points for that, so they can get a cheeky win out of that, so just be careful about it. Um, use Sauron to hunt one hero at a time. Be careful about Sauron's combats. The opponent is going to do everything possible to stop his combats from working. This could mean a Sorcerer's Blast, for instance, if you surround him with orcs, and then Sauron, they can Sorcerer's Blast combat and knock Sauron and the entire combat to the ground. That will save their hero. So you don't want that happening. Uh, so a use, in that case, a track with attack with Sauron, but then surround their model like just a little less than one inch with orcs. Don't actually charge. That way, the only viable target with a Sorcerer's Blast is Sauron himself, whom, of course, can resist it. Then uh, you have other things like being hurled, siege weapon blast, stuff like that. Now pay attention to the wordings of siege weapon blast because oftentimes it won't knock Sauron down, but it'll knock everyone else down. Oftentimes siege weapons do not knock down models with strength 6 or lower if they're not the target. Or strength 5 or lower, sorry. And uh, so just pay attention to those things. What does knock him down, what doesn't? Because they are going to make sure everything possible is going to knock down that combat. I believe hurls don't have such a restriction. So if your opponent is hurling, then just make sure to use a hurl combat. Throw in maybe a taskmaster or a captain into the combat with Sauron. Call a hurl combat so that way it goes off before the hurl does. So just things to note. Um, also, you probably want to use your magic in a such a way to, I, I would say the most valuable spells you have are like Drain Courage on Sauron Assassins and Compel on things you want Sauron to kill. So Drain Courage, what I mean by that is uh, obviously if you have someone like Aragorn, it just simply draining his courage will make it where you fight Aragorn when you want to and not when Aragorn wants to. Aragorn's Andoril sword will deal with Sauron actually pretty quickly. Uh, also Azog who wounds all heroes on three, stuff like that. So, uh, and also the last thing to note is siege weapons. Siege weapons can make short work of Sauron from a distance. So what you're going to want to do is have Sauron, one, under a roof. Remember in the new rules there is stipulations where if someone has a volley fire siege weapon and you are underneath something with the, something over your head, it actually creates an in the way. Now this is a little hard with Sauron because Sauron's so tall, but uh, the ruins of Osgiliath from GW box sets and also trees generally provide that kind of cover. Just talk with your opponent about it, but normally I'll do it. Otherwise, troll drums, move him forward, create zones where you have an orc who's like two or six inches away, depending on how the siege weapon works. I'm sorry, three or six inches away. And uh, allow the shot to scatter off of him. Just protect sound at all costs, of course, which is great. I love how the army works in that way. So the final thing that we're looking at here is Sauron, uh, I'm sorry, the how to buy section of this video. And uh, I normally call this how to buy for under $100. I'm going to say about $100 because prices keep fluctuating and I have to stay in touch with the market. Now keep in mind, guys, this is a video is being filmed as of December 8th, 2018. So if anything changes and price fluctuations, I can't predict it. I don't know if there's going to be a Last Alliance box set that comes out one day, a supplement, and then we have new characters for Sauron and his hordes. So just remember the filming of this video. These videos can become obsolete in parts. Uh, you know, unfortunately, my last video in the Rangers became obsolete, like I think one week afterward when, you know, their heroes came on for sale. 
So let's look at it. We got Sauron for $41. This is not your most obvious pick. You're going to have to buy him. The, you know, if you want to play the arm, you got to pay the big boy. Uh, the second thing, though, is the orcs. Now, the orcs are in a weird position because I'm tempted to say that simply spending $4, 40 sorry, $12 for 24 orcs is a worthwhile investment, and it is. I think they're a fantastic price. They're a little less than $2 a model. I think that is worth the investment. However, orcs are extremely common. Uh, you can probably find them all over eBay. You can find them all over the Facebook trading groups. You can, I mean, they are probably one of the most commonly like sold in bulk models ever. It would be very easy for you to start your force without actually buying from GW for your orcs. Now, before anyone says to me that, you know, hey, you're not supporting the Hobbit Hobby. No, what I'm trying to do is get a new guy into the game very quickly. And of course, later on, buy the, you know, Mortal Command sets, buy the Morgul Knights, buy the Witch King on Fell Beast, buy from your local GW, and then there you go, supporting your Hobbit Hobby. But for those trying to get into this hobby for cheap, not a lot of investment, see how you like the game, I would start off with Sour. 24 orcs probably from GW if you got to do it from GW and you just can't find them on eBay which should be impossible you should be able to find them on eBay but if you can't $40 for the orcs and then what I'll do is spend another $40 for one more box set of orcs all you have to do is paint one of your orcs so that way he looks very very different from the rest you guys this is where you can get into conversions maybe cut the head off an orc put it on a new Minorian soldier maybe he just killed the body of one or an elf or whatever and you know now he's got their armor on that works paint some blood on it and uh, then also you can convert up your own little banner. And uh, you should be pretty good to go. In fact, to be honest, that should be well over 700 points at that point as soon as you get the second box set. If you only get one box set, then you can probably play at about 600 points. Just convert one of your orcs into a, a captain, once again, and you can probably just fill out the rest of the points. It should be 144 for the orcs, and then, or a little less, and then you know the captain plus 400 points for Sauron. So that is how I would start this off. Just do the classic... Uh, the classic examples you see in the movie. Orc Horde, Sauron, good to go. So anyway, guys, that concludes this how-to-play video. I imagine this one should stay pretty relevant for a while because uh, Better Door can't ally with anybody, and I don't really see it changing anytime soon unless the Anarion reference in the, uh, in the, the Lord of the Rings books uh, means that we're going to get a Last Alliance supplement in the near future. And in that case, I still don't see this army changing that much. It's not like it's missing anything from the books. So uh, let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you have any suggestions of your own based on your own play experience. As I mentioned, I did only play them in one tournament, but it was five rounds at 1,000 points. And Throne of Skulls is a lot more competitive this year and previous years. So I felt very confident I fought against solid armies. Uh, so let me know what you guys think, and I will see you all very soon.